Are you able to open it up, uh, Dakota? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. I'll do that in just one sec. Let me open up my timer on my phone too, just in case. Okay, starting broadcast. Hello, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our second in our webinar series hosted by Blue Zones Project of Southwest Florida and Sicarelli Advisory Services. This session will be focusing on the financial well being for the retiree but please feel welcome to join us for our next webinar, where we'll discuss financial well-being for individuals and small business owners on Wednesday, May 27th, from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. For more information or to register, you can visit the Eventbrite page at the URL listed below. I'm Dakota, and I'm the Director of Communications at Sigrelli Advisory Services. And I'll be kicking things off and briefly going over how you can use the GoToWebinar functions so you have the best experience during the webinar. First, you'll need to locate your control panel. This is the box that should have popped up when you joined. And it should have different windows that say audio and questions, as well as icons popping out on the left-hand side, going from top to bottom that look like a microphone, a computer screen, and a hand. The computer screen will control the view of the presentation, maximized or minimized, and we suggest viewing in full screen for best experience. At the end, we'll have a Q&A session with the speakers where we'll, we'll try to cover as many questions as possible. You can type any questions you have into the questions area in the control panel. This is below audio. You can pose your questions here at any point during the presentation and our presenters will answer at the end. There should also be an area that says handouts. This is where I'll place any supplemental documents and any documents placed here will also be emailed out in a follow-up correspondence. I will shift over to our speakers so you can meet everyone. From the financial planning team at Sicarelli Advisory Services, we have Jill Raps, who is a certified financial planner, partner, and advisor. <laughs> as well as Jason Gilbert, who is a certified financial planner as well. And from Luzo's Project of Southeast Florida, we have Executive Director, Deb Logan, and Director of Marketing and Public Relations, Sebastian Sana. Now that you know who's who, I'll pass things over to Deb Logan to talk a bit about why we're here. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dakota, and welcome, everyone. We really appreciate your tuning in. Uh, as many of you may know, Blue Zones Project is sponsored in Southwest Florida by NCH Healthcare System. Our project partners with individuals and organizations to help people live longer, healthier, happier lives. We do this by engaging partners in work sites, schools, homeowners associations, faith-based organizations, restaurants, and grocery stores to help make healthy choices easier. To assure that we're accomplishing our mission, we use a measurement tool called the WBI or Wellbeing Index. And that's what you see on this slide. It's actually a survey that um, we ask individuals or we hire a company that actually does a, a survey throughout Southwest Florida to ask individuals a series of questions based on the five elements of well-being. So you can see those five elements here, community, physical, purpose, social, and financial all are critically important to support a life well lived. We know if any one of these elements drops significantly that there can have a, it can have a serious impact on our health and wellness. So with this in mind and also knowing that during these times many people are struggling financially 
or worried about that they might be struggling in the future. Uh, we asked one of our amazing uh, partners, they are a Blue Zones recognized organization, Sicarelli Advisory Services, if they could help. And they graciously said yes. So therefore, um, they're going to provide some really nice guidance for you today. And it's my pleasure to welcome or uh, turn this over to Jill and Jason. Thank you. Deb, we're so happy to be here with all of you today and to share what we think is critical information for the retiree during this very challenging time. What we're going to cover today is key concepts that we want to remind you of, of how to secure your lifestyle during this time. We're also going to cover the SECURE Act, which was passed at the end of the year, as well as the CARES Act which we're going to highlight specific areas just for the retirees so you can understand some of the tools that have come in recently to um, change the way we plan. And third, which is my favorite area, we're going to cover opportunities. And Jason and I are going to highlight two or three opportunities that we think people could consider um, in their financial plan. So let me start first with just the state of the economy. And I think about the state of the economy like a forest fire. When a forest fire starts, it starts really small and then it spreads very quickly. And then you have the embers that kind of fly in different areas and start new fires. Well, I think of COVID-19 like this because I remember when it started in China and I had a lot of empathy for the people over there, but I also had relief. It's not coming to us. And within several weeks, the COVID-19 had spread around the world. And just like a forest fire, you see the helicopters up on top with their big water bags, dropping water on the fire. The fire department and the rescue are doing everything they can to contain the fire. And that's what our government has done. They've come in and pulled out all, you know, many of the tools that they have in order to contain how the COVID not only affects our life, but how it affects the economy. They reduced interest rates. They brought stimulus plans to us. They brought the CARES Act to small businesses. And they did, um, obviously, social distancing to try to you know, keep us well. And the good thing is they stepped up quickly and they step, stepped up fiercely. So that's, that was a, probably a good thing. And we are in kind of the second phase now. We're starting to see uh, uh, states open up, and we're not really sure what that means to us yet. Are we going to continue to move forward, or are we going to take a few steps back? So we'll go through that stage. And at the third stage, we're going to come to a period where we feel much more comfortable. We can control this COVID-19. Maybe we can even solve it. And we'll get into the reality stage. How did all of this really affect the economy? We don't know yet. So you have to be prepared from this point on for a lot of ups and downs because we could move forward a little bit and move back a little bit. But just like a forest fire, when it's done, over a couple of years, trees begin to grow again. It becomes even more beautiful than it was before. We will be in a stage where we will recover, we'll have innovation, and it'll probably improve our lives, most of our lives, ultimately in the long run. So the first thing that we have to think about with all this change happening is what kind of state are we in? And typically, we tend to be in a limbo state. Um, we're kind of tied to how we used to live, and it's very difficult to go into the future. In fact, the future we, we're preparing for today is much different than the future we're actually grounded in. So there's going to be a ton of change. And when this happens, a lot of times we feel anxiety. It's very difficult to make good financial decisions. And when you think about it, if you understand our brain, when we uh, are posed a threat to us, the first thing that happens is it goes to a certain portion of our brain that wants to fight or flight. It's kind of like seeing a bear in the woods your brain really works well in that instance because the first thing you want to do is get out of harm's way. 
you certainly don't want to be sitting and contemplating all the different ways that you can get out of the situation. So it works really well there. But it doesn't work really well when we go through challenges like we have today because fight or flight. The first thing it's going to do is get to safety, whatever that means for you. And you really won't be reasoning uh, as you start to make your financial decisions. So if you're aware of that state and understand what you go through when you start to feel anxiety and fear, um, you can accept it and then go to the next stage, which is really being in a better state to make financial decisions, which we'll talk a little bit about how to get there. Um, but that is where you connect your values and your goals to your, your financial plan. You, yes, you still feel challenged because there's a lot of change going on, but you're more inspired with change, you grow, and you're more confident in the decisions that you're making. So the first step to that is to assess where you are, not only assess the state of mind, but also assess where you are financially. And the first thing I think about is all the questions we hear from retirees during this typical time. Will my money last? Can I afford to help my children and grandchildren during this time? Will I have to reduce my lifestyle? Will I have enough for health care? Can I still make big purchases during this time? Can I still take a trip with my family? So these are key questions. And of course, when the market drops, these become more crucial. How do you solve these? Um, typically, we say hold off on big expenses during times like this, and let, you know, if you have to sell something out of the market to do that, or if you have to reduce your cash dramatically, that it'll put you in a, a not a great position three or four months from now. But we also have to know our numbers. And what I mean by that is we have to understand where our money is going and what our expenses are. And you'd be surprised how often we ask people what their expenses are. And they think, hmm, it's about, I don't know, it could be a hundred, 150,000, we're not sure. Well, that's a big difference. So if you haven't gone through that exercise yet of knowing where you're spending your money and where it's going, now is the time to do it. And I just want to make a note in your handout that there is an expense sheet attached there that can help you go through that process. You can open it up, save it on your computer, or print it. But I think, um, you know, what happens with this period of time and making decisions is you have to um, know kind of where your income is coming from. That's really important. Is it coming from equities? Are you selling? Is it coming from social security, pension? Um, is it coming from dividends and interest? So that's really important because it's not a time to be a seller in the market in order to um, uh, reach your lifestyle goal. So by doing this expense exercise, knowing where your assets and liabilities are and knowing where your money is, that can help you decide if you need to make any changes during this period of time. I had a client uh, the other day, she is perfectly fine, perfectly secure through this period of time, but she talked with her daughter and her daughter lost her job and her daughter is going to college this fall and they really need help, they're really struggling. And she called us and she said, Jill, I don't care what I need to do, I wanna help her. So if I need to reduce expenses for a year, year and a half, I'll do it. Now, we didn't have to guess where to do that. We knew exactly where her money was being spent so that we could easily go through that process to say, does she need to reduce an expense in order to help her daughter? So those are the types of things I'm, I'm talking about. And I think the other thing is you need to build your plan um, and be able to take your money from smart places. So you have to um, uh, manage your finances in whether we're in good times or bad times. You have to be ready for both and plan for both. And it's kind of just like people who don't know whether they're gonna live a short life or a long life. If you're gonna live a short life, you want life insurance so your family can be secure. If you're gonna live a long life, you might wanna consider disability or long-term care insurance. You don't know, so you actually plan for both. 
And that's kind of what we want to do in these challenging times, because then we are not as anxious and we don't have to make major changes in how our lifestyle is going. So the other thing that's really important, I think, is to dig deep and understand what your values are and your goals. Because if you do, you don't necessarily have to make a lot of changes during challenging times. And let me talk to you a little bit about that real quick, because I think it is an important exercise if you haven't done it already. And um, I'll give you an example of, of a client. So I have a, we had a client that um, her grandchildren lived all over the United States. And she really, really loved them, wanted to show her support, but only saw them a couple times a year. So she used to give them money every December. At least she felt good. She was giving them $5,000. They could do whatever they want. And it was from grandma. And they really appreciate it. But after we sat down with her, we actually learned that not only does she want to develop those relationships with her grandchildren, the family had a passion for travel. So what we designed with her was to create a plan where every time a grandchild graduated from high school, they got to select where they wanted to travel around the world. She would pay for it and she would go on the trip with them. So not only would she cover it, but the child got the experience of planning the trip. And boy, can you imagine what it was like to experience seven to 10 days just together, just the two of them? They will not forget that. So that's what I mean about aligning your finances to your passion and goals. And you can see the slide says values plus goals equals behavior. And when you get to this point, you don't have to be so anxious. Now, we are going to give you a tool at the end to actually dig deep and see how, you know, if you, if you haven't done it, a tool that will help you to um, get that started. So just to recap real quick, know your numbers, assess your state of mind and accept it, go to the next state of mind, review, document, and share your goals. There's something about sharing and, and documenting your goals that make them much more powerful. Understand where your money is going understand where your income is coming from, and plan for both good and challenging times. So let's go to the next uh, phase, and um, that is really to understand what support is out there um, in order to help you during this period of time that you might want to consider um, taking advantage of um, if you haven't already. So the first, um, area. Jason, why don't you cover that? Thanks, Jill. Um, so I love the analogy of the fires and the helicopters dropping uh, huge amounts of water to try to distinguish the fires. Also want you to picture or envision um, a, a bridge being built, a financial bridge. And that's really what, what the Congress and um, the government has tried to do to help people uh, navigate this difficult period of time. And the first part of that is a bill that was passed back in March called the CARES Act. And um, one part of that is in the form of uh, stimulus checks, which, uh, by the way, are not taxable. These are considered a refundable tax credit. And individuals are eligible for up to $1,200 each, so $2,400 uh, if you're married, filing jointly, as well as a $500 check uh, per dependent. Um, and those, you can see there's a phase out for those checks. Um, the phase outs, uh, if your individual is 75 to 99,000, and then 150 to 198,000 if you're married filing jointly. Many um, of our clients have already received those checks, um, but if you haven't received it or if you have any questions, we have, we have a resource on this slide uh, on the bottom uh, that you might want to visit. It's on the IRS's uh, website. Um, just in case uh, you have any questions or, or they need additional information uh, to, to process your stimulus check. So let's talk a little bit about uh, retirement accounts and uh, in the context as well of the CARES Act. Um, so one of the provisions for retirees allows uh, individuals to waive the required minimum distributions uh, for 2020 for this year only. So um, this is not a one size uh, fits all. Uh, there's many different factors to consider if you're thinking about taking advantage of this waiver. And probably the, the first question uh, you should be asking yourself is number one, uh, do I need the income? If not, 
this is a unique opportunity uh, to allow for your investments to recover. And if you're going to go ahead and take advantage of the waiver, um, you'll also need to take into consideration um, how it might impact other things like your income, right? Because if you're going to waive it, you're likely going to have reduced income. And then also your taxes, because for many, um, they're using their required minimum distributions as part of their tax planning strategy uh, to withhold taxes and have it directly go uh, to the U.S. government. Um, that might be, um, you know, paying quarterly estimates uh, to make up for that um, difference in taxes. So that's something that you want to check with your advisor and check with your CPA on. Also, if you already took your required minimum distribution, it's possible that you can undo it or roll it back into your retirement account. Um, they're allowing, if this distribution was done on February 1st or later, it's possible it could be rolled back into your retirement account and um, it can be rolled in all the way until July 15th, okay? However, if you were directly impacted by COVID-19, you, your spouse, or dependent, it's possible it could be rolled in uh, within the next three years. Lastly, um, as you're making this decision with your team, um, it's also important to consider it in the context of um, the current tax environment. So can we just go back to that slide? Just let's finish. Um, so taxes is really important. And if we just will rewind back to 2017, we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, law passed, which changed uh, the tax landscape, landscape dramatically. What it did is it cut tax rates for corporations dramatically, but it also cut tax rates for individuals. Okay, so um, right now we're seeing historically low tax rates, which for individuals do sunset uh, at the end of 2025. And as a result, that's something you really should consider um, because we really uh, we have a, a paradigm of, of thinking as it relates to taxes. It used to be with traditional tax planning, uh, defer and minimize taxes where possible. However, with historical low tax rates, um, it might be something where you might want to take advantage of these lower tax rates uh, while they're still in play. So again, not a one size fits all, and there's many different factors uh, to consider. So if we rewind uh, to earlier this year, we had the SECURE Act passed, uh, which so much has happened uh, since then. Many of us have, have uh, forgotten about this, this law that was passed, uh, but it was passed and it changed many, many different things, um, including the age at which you have to take your required minimum distribution. So under prior law, you had to start taking withdrawals from your retirement accounts. This would be IRAs, 401ks, 403Bs, 457s. You had to start that at age 70 and a half. That's been changed now to 72, okay, uh, except for this year. Um, also, if you're age 70 and a half or older, it used to be once you reach that age, you are no longer able to contribute to your IRAs. However, under the SECURE Act, um, now you can still add to your IRAs if you have earned income. And then lastly, probably the most dramatic change to the retirement uh, planning is the elimination of the stretch, the lifetime stretch as it relates to beneficiaries. So let's talk a little bit about that and what that means. Typically, you can, under prior law, you could stretch uh, a retirement account out if you were the beneficiary over your lifetime, right? So it was based off of life expectancy tables. And uh, for some, that could be many, many years. Well, now under the SECURE Act, that has been shortened to 10 years for non-spouses, uh, as well as a few uh, other uh, exceptions. Uh, so you can see that's a pretty dramatic change. Um, and, um, you know, having that stretch uh, go away, you really need to take a look at your financial plan to see um, if you need to make any adjustments. So just as a reminder, some resources for you is to go into your handouts. And actually, Jason just recently uh, wrote an article with another advisor at Sickroy Advisory to RMD or not RMD could be a nice little um, 
uh, article to read and also the SECURE Act. So we did a quick summary of what the SECURE Act features are and that may be a nice follow-up for you as a resource. So my mother, mother and father uh, always taught us, which we're very happy about, how to seek opportunity. And this becomes very difficult when we're in a high state of emotion. In fact, op opportunities tend to be very obscure and hard to find. So it's a, it's a process of really you've got to shift how you're thinking. And today we're going to cover what we think could be some opportunities from all this support and the SECURE Act. But before I do that, um, to open that up, I want to cover three main rules that for the 35 years we've been in business, we've never seen change. There is a lot changing, but these three rules don't change. One is, we've heard it all before, buy low, sell high. Sounds like a very easy concept. We should be able to do that if we're a long-term investor. But it's interesting that most investors never achieve market returns because they don't do that at the right time. I'm sure you've seen this before, but it's called the emotional roller coaster. And we all go on it. As the market drives up, we're getting excited and we anticipate and we begin to invest. In fact, you start to hear your friends and family say, I better get in the market. It's just doing so great. And then all of a sudden we see some price decline. And we get a little anxious, but we think maybe it'll come back. We're not going to quite expect it yet. And it continues to go down until we get panicked, until we get somewhat depressed. And then when we can't handle it anymore, what are we doing like we saw the bear in the woods? Flight to safety. So pull out assets, go into maybe cash or do whatever you need to do to feel safe. Now, is that the right thing to do? Well, it may not be because we haven't really had a chance to really look to see if there should be any changes being made. So it's really important that you think about this as the market's going down and actually find when it is an opportunity to invest and you have the ability to invest that maybe that's something you should consider. And I think a big question we hear is should I get all my money out because I don't want to deal with this. I can just sleep better at night. I don't really care that I'm going to, you know, have some losses. And typically, we really don't tell them to do that. If they have a long-term plan in place, let's stay on the train track and not have that train fall off. Yeah, I think that um, I would agree, Jill, to be a successful investor, um, really important to keep a long-term perspective. It's so important. And one of the traps or missteps of many in individuals is really trying to get in and out of the market or try to time the market. It's very, very, very dif difficult. And what we're illustrating on this slide, um, this, is, this is kind of interesting, showing the S&P 500 index returns over a period of time um, from 1999 to 2018, uh, average close to, to 6%. But then what we can see is if we missed just a, a few days, um, the 10 best days, you can see what the, the returns are, how dramatic the change is. So missing 10 of the best days of the market reduced the returns uh, from 5.62% to, to a little over 2%, which is huge. Okay, It's pretty hard to find those 10 best days, right? <laughs> and then obviously missing more of those days, uh, even more dramatic. So we would argue that it's time in the market and not timing the market that's most, most important and paramount to your long-term success of being an investor. That's a great point, Jason. And I think the next step from here, if you're securing your planning um, and you have the opportunity, you either have some cash sitting or you might have an opportunity to buy, um, why should you be buying right now? So I kind of love this illustration. It uh, shows three different investors and they do different things when the market goes down. So the first investor here um, in the yellow, this investor, every time the market drops by 8%, he takes, they take 2000 out of the market because they're nervous. The next investor, they've got a long-term strategy in place and the short-term volatility doesn't really derail them too much, so they just stay invested. Look at the difference between the two. Now the third investor, you wonder who this is. How did they reach that height? 
Because when the market drops by 8% every month that it dropped by 8%, they invested $2,000. So the difference between an investor who sells out $2,000 to an investor that actually takes advantage of the discounted market and buys in. It's huge. That's a significant difference. Now, obviously, we're, we're showing you a lot of long-term uh, numbers here, but it works um, in one, three, five years to see the difference in what those opportunities can mean if you're in the right place to take them. So that is our third rule, that if you can, take advantage and opportunity as long as you're comfortable on what to do and where to go. Let's talk a little bit about some opportunities to take advantage of some time-tested strategies uh, that have really paid off for investors. And the first one is called cross-reinvesting. And this is really a strategy where you're taking uh, income uh, from some conservative parts of the portfolio and then reinvesting them into some other growth-oriented parts of the portfolio. And this could be uh, taking some uh, interest income, for example, from bonds within the portfolio. And then instead of buying more bonds or buying new bonds, you could actually be buying equities uh, when the prices are down. The next strategy, um, absolutely love, because one of the things that's difficult when we're going through a period of stress and volatility, uh, which we've certainly had our share uh, these last couple of months, is called dollar cost averaging. And this is really a great strategy uh, for investing cash uh, over time. Um, many uh, individuals, uh, with their excess cash uh, or discretionary income, it's a, just a great way of, of deploying that um, and, and getting some buys. Um, and really, the the, um, the strategy works like this. It's really about taking a set amount of money and just investing uh, that amount uh, on a set period of time. It could be each month. Um, it could be uh, every couple of weeks. Um, it's uh, one, one example of that, is, which um, probably many of your kids or grandkids are participating in, is with their 401ks. And love that mm -hmm. strategy too, where they're just taking a certain amount of money um, from their income uh, each week or every pay period and uh, doing some buying because it, it's so difficult to try to time the markets again. Um, and this is just a great, great way to average in over time. And then the last uh, idea is, is um, this would be more for uh, in the event that you're looking at building cash. And again, um, as Jill mentioned, this is really not a time, a great time to be selling, right? Because asset prices are down. So one idea is instead of reinvesting that income, whether it's um, dividends from the stock part of the portfolio or interest payments from the bonds, uh, consider having those dividends pay to cash and building up that cash bucket. And again, this is this would be helping you avoid having to sell uh, any assets, and it could be significant over time. And you know, it's interesting, Jason, how many people don't know if their dividends are being reinvested or paying to cash, right? And also, if they pay to cash, it could be opportunities as well for investing um, as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, some opportunities with what we call the Roth conversion. And this is a strategy in your retired years, if you want to leave a legacy for your children or your beneficiaries, I think it's an amazing strategy and it can work real well, but there's a lot of variables to consider. But what the Roth conversion is, is you say, I wanna pay the tax today on my IRAs or a portion of the IRA. I wanna move it into a Roth. And then for the rest of my life, that'll grow tax deferred and tax free. And when my beneficiaries inherit it, when they take it out, they get it tax free. So it is an amazing opportunity to build assets that can become tax free assets. But you have to consider obviously your tax rate. Why are we talking about that today? Because when the market's down, this is a good time to do it. Move it from your IRA with values being down, move it over to a Roth and let it appreciate in your Roth. The other thing is because we don't have to take required minimum distributions this year, you might consider still taking money out of your IRAs and converting them to the Roth. And by the way, everybody, uh, retirees, it doesn't matter what your income is, can do Roth conversions, but be careful because you can't reconvert. 
So you want to make sure that it's, um, you know, a good strategy for you. Um, you know, Jason kind of mentioned this, but encourage your children and grandchildren to invest at this time. You know, you have the wisdom and you have the time to spend with them. If they are in 401k plans or let's say they work and they don't have a Roth account, why not open one up and tell them that you'll match every dollar that you put in? What a significant present that would be in the long term for them. Also, this is a great time to consider gifting. Uh, under current law, everyone is allowed to gift up to 15,000 uh, per individual without any gift tax uh, taxes, as well as taking advantage of those provisions to fund uh, 529s. These would be education savings accounts. Um, and you can actually accelerate those gifts and do up to five years of your gifts to a 529 education mm -hmm. account. Can you imagine doing that today uh, when prices again are down, how meaningful that could be um, when uh, your grandchild or um, great grandchild is ready for college? Uh, that could be really significant. And of course, talking about charity, um, us at Ciccarelli, you know, charity is very, very important to us as it is to our clients. And um, there's some provisions of the CARES Act um, that you might want to consider taking advantage of as well. And uh, the first one is a $300 above the line charitable deduction. So whether you itemize or you don't itemize, um, this could be an additional tax benefit for you uh, to take advantage of. And then lastly, if you're looking at making some more significant gifts to charities, these would be cash gifts. And of course it has to be to a, a 501c3 uh, charitable organization. It can't be to a donor advised fund but they have relaxed uh, the income limitations uh, for those gifts. Under prior law, um, you were limited to 60% of your AGI or adjusted gross income, and they have relaxed that for this year. So you can gift um, up to 100% of your adjusted gross income and get a tax benefit. So again, check with your advisor, check with your CPA. Um, these could be some really unique opportunities uh, for helping out charities right now. What a great way, if you're charitably orientated, to fill that value bucket up and your goal bucket at this point. We just have a few minutes, and I think I'd like to cover, if we can, Jason, tax harvesting. We kind of skipped over that because we're uh, trying to give you time to answer some questions. So at this time, I'm just going to remind you that you can chat any questions because we're going through a lot of information. We're here for a resource for you today. Please uh, feel free to ask us questions. And let's just talk a few minutes about tax loss harvesting because that's an interesting concept as well. So tax loss harvesting uh, is, a, is a neat strategy to really make lemonade out of lemons. And um, <laughs> you know, of course, you know, today with asset prices down, this could be a strategy that would be applicable to your non-qualified or taxable part of the portfolio where you're basically you're taking um, and selling uh, stocks or funds at a loss. And those losses then could offset gains this year as well in, into future years. OK, so that could be really powerful. We saw this um, as a unique strategy back in 2008, 2009. Uh, for those who were invested uh, during that time as well, um, those really paid off the, you know, that strategy because those losses then could offset gains for actually many people for many years. Uh, so that's one strategy. And, and um, also, if you don't use all of your losses um, for the current year, they can also reduce ordinary income. And that could be up to 3000 per year if you're married filing jointly. So again, really, really powerful strategy. And then lastly, talking about rebalancing, what is this and how does that work? Some asset classes have actually um, done really well uh, through this volatile period of time, and some obviously haven't. So this is really a strategy where you're selling or taking some profits from some of your winners, and you're doing some buying when things are on sale. And this is just, again, um, being a little opportunistic, and, and um, this can really you know, pay dividends um, over time and, and be uh, you know, a nice long-term strategy. 
Thanks, Jason, for covering that. So we're running out of time for our presentation. Jason and I could talk for hours here, but I'd like to leave room for questions. This is an opportunity to go into the chat and have some time to think about questions. But before we go there, I love to talk about some of the silver linings that are happening through the COVID-19 um, if we're looking for them. And, you know, I love the idea of, um, you know, how has family stayed connected? So I want to give you a, a one um, story. I had a client who turned 90 the other day and she was in a, a home care facility and she couldn't even see her daughter. So they couldn't celebrate her birthday in person. But what the daughters did is they developed a parade of cars and signs. Her husband used to be in the fire department, so the fire department was there, and they had a huge parade, and she sat on her porch that was about 30 feet away and just cried, just cried, and saw all her wonderful friends and how much people supported her, and I thought that was such a great idea. How about you, Deb? Have you seen any, uh, heard, what, what silver linings have you heard about? You know what, I think the number of people that are connecting in family reunions uh, by using Zoom or Skype or some sort of uh, web-based mm. platform is really, really exciting. I know I personally um, had not seen my great nieces and nephews that have been born in the last couple of years. My family is scattered all over the country. And to see them and meet them was a golden opportunity that we never thought of before COVID. So hopefully we're all getting more savvy with our online platforms. That is really neat. How about you, Jason? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, people that like to socialize and people that like to travel, obviously what we're going through is very unnatural, right? So um, yeah. I would agree, Deb. I think, um, you know, we've um, we've taken advantage of technology and things like Zoom and, and uh, uh, you know, connected with family, um, you know, people that I haven't seen in, in a long time and just checking in and saying hello, it's, it's been a great opportunity to do that. That's neat. I just heard another client who has a standing card game with his grandson. They're like four and six and every week they do a card game and continue it on the computer. <laughs> How about you, Sebastian? Uh, you know, I agree with the, the whole, um, you know, the, the Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams using those has been really uh, amazing in keeping people connected. And then, you know, of course, you know, when you, when you go on um, social media, you see these viral posts of like grandkids um, staying in touch with their grandparents, whether they're just standing outside the window, right, and, and talking to them. You know, you can't give them a hug, but yet you still see them in person, you know, and I think that's very powerful, you know, to to be able to do that and, um, you know, and seeing people do that, it's very, very heartwarming. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you know, it's it's like you, um, I think all of us is push the pause button a little bit, you know, we're able to breathe and spend a little bit more time considering how we want to spend our life and, and with, you know, who we want to spend it with. And I just want to mention here, because I promised you a tool, to get closer and document your passions, your goals, your values, so that you can align your money more closely to what's so important to you. And it's the Blue Zones Purpose Workshop. I just love that workshop. And what's exciting is it's become virtual. So anybody listening to this webinar can actually go and take that workshop. And if you haven't spent an hour, hour and a half on just focusing on you, this is a great way to do it. So thank you guys, Blue Zones, for, for offering that. That's just fabulous. So before we're ready to get into questions, and Dakota, I know you're going to uh, ask us any questions that came in uh, today. Um, do you have any questions coming in? I do. I have some questions, just a few. Um, but uh, the first one I have here is uh, how much money should I keep in cash or conservative areas to help protect me during challenging times. Good one. Do you want to cover that, Jason? Absolutely. So it's going to depend. Um, you know, are you? It's going to depend on your income. Obviously, everyone's situation is a little bit different. Some people, um, in addition to if you're retired, you might have pension income. Uh, depends on how your portfolio is structured. You might have just steady, consistent dividend income, which um, even though prices have fluctuated, we've seen a ton of volatility 
um, a, a lot of that income has been pretty consistent, which is beautiful. So it really depends on everyone's situation, but um, I would say having a couple years of money set aside um, uh, in conservative areas um, is probably a, a prudent thing to do. Everybody, again, is, is a little um, unique in their situation. So, um, but I would say at least two years if you're retired and you're relying off of your portfolio, um, that's probably gonna give you peace of mind, right? Uh, to be able to ride out a period of time like this um, knowing that you're in a good position financially uh, to let things recover and you're not forced to sell. Boy, that's, that's a great point, Jason, because when you have that, you're not as anxious, right? Then you can actually take the time to decide whether you need to make changes or not. Great question. And we have another question. Uh, with most beneficiaries having to elect a 10-year payout, and pay taxes on inherited IRAs, what are some things I need to consider because of the change? Yeah, this is a big area and there absolutely is a lot of, you know, variables that could affect your decisions here. Um, but, you know, the important thing is if you have large IRAs, it's a consideration that you want to, you know, dig deep and find out what all the variables are to make that decision. Um, also, you want to think about, is it really important uh, to consider the legacy you're leaving your children and having them have the ability of not to pay all the taxes on the IRAs or to be able to pay those taxes over time? Um, so there are some planning techniques that you could consider. Um, and um, uh, again, they're pretty complicated. We probably can't cover them here with the couple minutes that we have, um, but we certainly could follow up with some information and articles on that. Jason, do you wanna cover anything else there that comes to mind for you that we could quickly go over? Well, I, I think that, you know, this is a, this is a question we could literally talk uh, about an hour for. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it really everyone's situation is a little unique because many of the kids are the beneficiaries of these retirement accounts. Um, you know, they're at their peak income years and peak tax years. Um, so looking at uh, the tax uh, situation of mom and dad versus the beneficiaries would be important. And then are the monies going um, outright uh, to the kids? Um, you know, are they going to a trust and then eventually benefiting the kids and then maybe the grandkids? So you can see how this could be um, a little bit uh, complex. And there's lots of uh, planning opportunities though out there, um, you know, that can be considered uh, to offset that, you know, is, it, is the individual insurable? Uh, maybe a life insurance could be an interesting solution to take a look at. Also, are they char charitably um, minded? Do they have charitable intent? Because there's also some advanced um, uh, planning as relates to charitable trust, which could potentially offset some of those tax liabilities. And then um, what Jill talked about earlier uh, with the Roth conversion, uh, one of the neat things about the Roth is, um, guess what? It's tax free, okay? So any dollars of those retirement accounts that you convert to a Roth, uh, that could be really meaningful uh, to the loved ones uh, inheriting this asset that's, uh, that's completely tax-free. Uh, the RMD or the required minimum distribution um, is still applicable, um, but uh, receiving uh, an asset uh, that's tax-free, um, you know, that, could, that could really be nice. Yeah, so I think if you have large IRAs in your um, portfolio, it's certainly something to get to your advisors and CPA and attorney and have them take a look at giving you some of the opportunities that are out there for planning. Okay, and we have just a small amount of time left, but we just have one question that just came in. Um, and they asked, can you briefly talk about annuities? Mm. <laughs> Brief is a key word. <laughs> um, I could say that there's a time and place for every type of investment. So be careful about what you read. It is information, but it may not pertain to you. So with annuities, they're quite complicated. They have three different parties on them, an owner, an annuitant, a beneficiary. You can get annuities with lots of bells and whistles that will guarantee future income, have death benefits, or have nothing on them. 
There's lots of reasons why you would be in an annuity. The question is, is to dive down on what you want to accomplish. Do you want to defer taxes? Uh, do you want to have guaranteed income, like I said, in the future? Is that important? Or is it important to leave a legacy for your kids? And as we dive down into those questions, or as you do that with your advisor, they would be able to point you in the direction of whether an annuity makes sense or not. But I'd say the biggest things we see with annuities is they're very complicated. Most people that have them don't understand how they work. They typically don't take advantage of all the bells and whistles that they can. And it is an asset that has to be managed on an ongoing basis because there's lots of changing uh, you know, parts and things like that in the annuity. So yes, they can make sense for some people. For others, it may not be a fit. Great. Thank you so much, Jill. And I think at that, we're going to have to uh, close out our Q&A session. But thank you so much for those wonderful, informative answers. Um, and if we were unable to get to your question, we will include up it, it in our follow-up email along with our event survey. We will encourage you to give us your honest feedback to help us craft future content to your interests. And if you have any questions following the webinar, you can direct the inquiries to Blue Zones Project Southwest Florida at sharecare.com with the subject line financial. We'll include this email as well in our follow-up correspondence. And with that, I'll turn things over to Deb Logan to close us out. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I, I just wanna say Jill, Jason, and Dakota uh, for sharing your expertise today. We really appreciate it. Um, and we hope that the, the attendees all feel a little less anxious. It always helps to talk about these things and kind of reset, you know, what do I know and what do I need to know? So um, thank you all for listening. We also want to, um, do we have the additional resources slide by chance? Uh, sure. Let me just, uh, I think, th is that the one you want, Deb? Yeah, if we have a moment to share um, some other ways that you can stay healthy. Financial well-being is really critical, as we talked about early on, but there are some other ways uh, in those elements of well-being. So I'm going to turn it over to Sebastian to share these things. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, so for the first um, link that you're going to see there, it's our free Power 9 online wellness activities. Um, this is a really, really resourceful page. When uh, the shelter in place first began, we reached out to um, our partner organizations and we asked them, hey, what are you guys doing um, now for well-being? Uh, especially knowing that uh, well-being was extremely critical at the time, and it still is for sure. Um, and it was amazing how many of them actually uh, returned, uh, you know, gave an answer to us and said, hey, we're, we're offering this online activity through our Facebook page, through our, uh, through our um, you know, website. And it's just, you know, we listed probably about uh, 30 to 40 different activities from, um, you know, from yoga to meditation to uh, fitness. Um, there's uh, virtual tours of the zoo, um, you know, gardening activities. There's, it's amazing how many are on there. So we definitely um, welcome everybody to visit that page. You know, as they say, um, health is wealth. You know, uh, I read a statistic recently mm -hmm that says that, that the average couple in retirement will spend about $285,000 in healthcare. So that's a pretty big amount. Mm -hmm. um, so we really wanna limit that as much as possible. You wanna keep that money in your pocket, right? To visit the grandkids, to travel, to do other fun activities. So definitely um, welcome you to just, just take care of your health um, and visiting these uh, virtual wellness activities and doing other Blue Zones project activities is really gonna, is beneficial, not only for your health, but financially as well. So um, keep that in mind. Um, the next Thanks, link Sebastian. There, yep, yep, absolutely. So, um, yeah, the next uh, link there is uh, Helping Hand Opportunities. We have a lot of um, nonprofits uh, that we work with that are partnered with us. And as we well know, uh, the, the need for, um, you know, for money, for food, for hygiene products is just, it's huge now. Um, you know, I was just yeah. recently in touch with several of them. And uh, you know they were just telling me how they are handing out record amounts of uh, food and supplies right now, and they just really, really need the help. So we uh, compiled a nice little list there with all the direct links to these nonprofits, um, and we'll 
you know, with a description of exactly what they need and um, great opportunity to give back. You know, um, I know, you know, when you give back, it's, it's um, really helps with taking you out of, you know, like the woe is me and putting you into that, you know, kind of hero mentality and, you know, and, um, you know, just uh, feels good to help other people for sure. And especially at a time like now, now, now is a great time to do it. And the third one there is the Blue Zones Project cooking demonstrations. So we know a lot of people are forced to uh, cook from home. Um, it's new to a lot of people. And uh, so we created these uh, wonderful Blue Zones Project uh, video cooking demonstrations, uh, simple, easy to make recipes that are uh, nutritious at the same time. And uh, they're also very entertaining to watch. So uh, please uh, visit, those, um, visit that page and learn how to cook great, healthy, tasty Mediterranean type dishes. Um, and then the last one there, um, as Jill alluded to before with the virtual purpose workshops, these are fantastic. Uh, everybody who goes to these uh, has nothing but amazing things to say about it. Um, we have the virtual one that's coming up on uh, June 17th at five o'clock. And you can, um, you can sign up for that on our Eventbrite page. Uh, the link is right there. Or you can also go to our uh, Facebook page and uh, visit our, the event section and sign up there as well. So please go ahead and check that out. So we're going to want to like your Facebook page so we can keep informed, right? <laughs> yes, yes, please <laughs> but do. But I just want to re yeah. re remind everybody that we will send copies of these slides out uh, after the presentation to everybody that's come in today so that you'll have these links as well as the link to our website if you want to learn more about some of the concepts that we've talked about. Uh, we have several articles that we've written that are on our website. So with that, Deb, I'll have you close out. Okay, just uh, what we hope more than anything is that you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, that everyone continues to stay well. So thank you so much for your time today, and we'll see you again.